Uh, but for now, it's time for questions for Walter and Attila. But before we get there, why don't we? Uh, why don't you guys uh, open us up? Is there anything you want to say to us before we begin? Oh well, I'm having a great time enjoying Decomp. <laughs> it's good to see uh, everyone and the and the great talks. Yeah, usually you're in this uh, uh, Jitsi instance with me, and uh, this time you're actually enjoying the talks. It's a different experience that way, right? Yeah, I, I like to you know move around my office and all that stuff, and it's kind of kind of difficult with the camera on. <laughs> Tell me about it. So, <laughs> you know, I uh, I may mainly listen to it. Yeah, no, that's good. I'm glad I'm glad you did. It uh, let you experience the talks. And uh, Attila, anything you want to say to everybody? I should have checked when decoff line was before I booked flights <laughs> to perfect time zone. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Um, what are you going to talk about at the next deconf? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. <laughs> yeah, I certainly have no idea. Well, I have a question for the community. Mm. On the news groups, there's people constantly talking about uh, clearing up and fixing the corner cases and rough edges of D. And it seems every time I try to do that, somebody comes out and says, I broke their code and I should not be doing this. So I find this to be a rather unresolvable dilemma. So what have you, what do you guys think? You know, what, how should, how should this be resolved? Ideally with some way to fix their code for them automatically, if that's possible. That's one way. The ones I'm thinking about, that it's not really possible to do it automatically. Spoof when I suggest using revert or something, then they object to that too. Spoofer says LTS releases and then break things. Well, I think we really need to do something similar to additions or epochs and be able to make breaking changes with the past that aren't breaking because the old code still works the same. Well, even when, even when you fix bugs, you're often breaking things. It's yeah. it's not so simple as just having a, a you know we only do bug fixes in this because what's a bug fix and what's a breaking change is it's not at all clear. Yeah, people have different ways of working and may even depend on that bug's behavior. Uh, I've heard multiple stories of people doing rewrites that don't work because, and this is where I picked up the phrase: it has to be bug compatible with the old version. Um, Brian Callahan says either an LTS release or dash standard equals D22, like, you know, C or C++. Oh. <laughs> no, I, 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 if we do, it has to be module by module, I think, instead of my thing. Uh, Ricky says we really need to talk with Ian about an LTS branch since he has already maintained one. When did Is he Ian here? No, Ian's not, not here. Okay. Unfortunately. Uh, Steve says almost all changes in D are breaking changes because of the introspection capabilities. I think that's a good point. Yeah. But I really don't want us to, you know, fall into C++ land where the, uh, you know, I was talking about this with Andre the other day, where all the corner cases get carefully documented and then it becomes frozen solid and never changes. And so... Uh, how C++ evolves is people layer on new features and, you know, ignore the previous ones. But it makes the language ever more complicated and kludgier to do that because nothing ever gets cleaned up. It just gets another layer put over it. And I've heard some um, comments from C++ people and some increasing sentiment on the Hacker News that C++ is kind of reaching a breaking point with all this layered on complexity. And, you know, Herb Sutter is working on CPP2, which is a, you know, a reimagining of C++. And then you've got Sean Baxter doing the same thing. And uh, yeah, the sentiment kind of appears to be shifting uh, towards a negative with C++ with these increasing layers of complicated additions to it and not fixing the stuff that later turned out to be uh, suboptimal or broken in, in the past. So I don't want to uh, head down that path. I know that breaking changes are painful, but, you know, we're uh, sitting on the horns of a dilemma here. Okay, we have a we have a question from Mike Shaw in uh, email, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I do want to uh, 
keep on this as long as people are commenting on it. I think uh, Steve says, I think the only way forward is to just break things and have an organized way to do it. Like what Spoofer said, have a path for people who don't want breaking changes. Well, that's kind of what the revert switchers are for, but that doesn't seem to be a good enough solution either. Okay. I think uh, this was probably, I, I don't think this is a serious question, but Brian Callahan said earlier, uh, import C++ when? <laughs> when? I wish. <laughs> the thing is, it took me 10 years to write a C++ compiler, and that's a C++ 98 compiler, not a C++ you know, 20 compiler. So as far as writing it the way I imp import C is written, unless I did that as a full-time job or somebody else picks it up, it isn't going to happen. Uh, the only way it probably could happen is to use LL or Clang, the Clang library to do the C++ for you. And even then, I think it would be a very difficult job. I would dearly like to do an import C++, but it uh, just seems impractical. Yeah, I think the only way to do it is the way the Carbon people are doing it, which is to basically take the C++ and, and interface with it at the AFC level. You mean translate it to C and then import it? No, the no, 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 internally the compiler to, to parse it, have an ASC, and then interface directly with the ASC because some, some of the concepts can't be translated to D. Um, this is why I stopped working on, on translating it in DPP because some, some of the things aren't translatable. Right. I know that. That's why to implement import C, there are these special C-only semantic routines in, in there. There are not many of them, but there are enough to make a source-to-source a -source translation um, impractical, shall we say. Well, was, when I encountered um, as reference the uh, C++ that's on the library, uh, then I realized I can't translate this by hand. So I definitely don't know how to write a program that can do it automatically either, because there are no reference types in these, and therefore I can't write a template to tell me if it's a reference type or not, because they don't exist. And then I realized that that thing is going to be used in Sfine somewhere, and I need to recognize that pattern to make it into, you know, template constraints in D. And there's like four different ways of, of doing it with enable if alone. So yeah, S S F N A I. When that appeared in C++, I, I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's one reason why, you know, D has the, the traits compiles thing. is that they clearly mark what, what should compile and what, and to test if something should compile, not just, you know, mm -hmm. oh, that didn't work. So we're just going to ignore this whole part of the code. I, I just, I didn't like that. I don't think it's a good design. All right, we have a question from Mike Shaw. Uh, any anecdotal reports of new D projects in industry that you know about? I'm asking because I'd like to share with my students. No, anything I can share. Yeah, I've got a couple people talking about that with email, but you know, I'm not supposed to talk about them. <laughs> I think Ali might know of a couple. Is Ali with us? Yes. No, I just follow the news group and, you know, fix problems. <laughs> That's what I do all day. Yeah, Ali's in the chat. Ali, do you know of any companies using D that uh, we aren't aware of? Oh, there was the company that offered to help us with, uh, uh, yeah. you know. Which we haven't announced yet. <laughs> we haven't announced yet. Okay. Yeah. But they, they announced that they're using D. They announced that they're using D. Uh, Ucora. Uh, so we'll have more to say about them later. Yeah. Okay. So Ali doesn't know anything that we aren't aware of already. So, okay. Uh, okay. We've got an email question from Steve, but yeah, I'll get to Steve's question. Spoofer asks, when's the pattern matching dip draft? When are we going to get a draft? Yeah. When is When are we going to have it? Well, I kind of set that aside for the moment while I'm working on a bunch of problems people said were critical, but I can get back to it. I think it's, it's pretty close to ready to go as a draft. Yeah, I think uh, people have been pretty clear about what they want and don't want in it. So I don't know, maybe by the end of the year, we can uh, dump it on uh, Mike's desk. Steve asks, speaking of breaking changes, are there any large things you would like to break if there were no drawbacks? Yeah. Well, so many. <laughs> auto decode. <laughs> That's probably the biggest one that causes us the most problems. Probably do a uh, safe by default. Yeah, definitely. Probably, I would rather use some types than exception handling. 
I just, uh, I, I worked with exception handling for a long time and it, you know, it, it just seems like a great idea and it's just not, I try to make all my own code so it doesn't need, doesn't throw exceptions. Well, the problem is in some types is there has to be a mechanism for propagating uh, the errors up because otherwise it's cumbersome to use. And to the extent of my knowledge, I've only seen Rust do that properly. They have a macro basically saying, I don't care if this is an error, return error. But that requires macros. Yeah. As you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of macros, but <laughs> there probably could be some other way of making that work. I haven't seen any. Ricky. Well, it's my job to figure out that stuff. <laughs> uh, Ricky says, I hope I'm going to be owing Walter a lot of beers, assuming he gets DLLs working correctly. Well, I'm sort of blocked at the moment. My uh, PRs to move in that direction have, uh, have all, you know, come to a complete standstill. So Is there anything anybody can do to help? Well, somebody can, you know, like approve them and st- <laughs> <laughs> You know, this, it, it's kind of frustrating. I seem to be spending all my time arguing about the PRs instead of uh, accomplishing things. So I moved away from that for the, the time being and trying to, you know, work on things that are going to get approved. Makes sense. Because one of the things I was working on was, uh, you know, better C doesn't, have, doesn't support static constructors, but it does support Pragma CRT constructor. But Pragma's CRT constructor has some uh, weaknesses with it. You know, it was just, it started out as a, just a clue I threw in there. And so I put in a pull request to fix it and make it a much uh, better supported thing. And it's just, it's just stalemated. And I went back and forth about how to fix some of the module info problems and getting uh, the CRT constructors to work is a, as a major part of that. So that has to move forward before I can fix the module info stuff. So this, this discussion uh, on exceptions. So uh, Ricky says uh, he's working on uh, dip for value type exceptions. It's mostly done. He just needs uh, the literature review. And Steve says, please don't remove exceptions. I actually like exceptions. Making them more efficient would be helpful. See my recent posts on dip 1008. So I guess... The, the, this isn't a question from them, but I, I, I would have a question on this. What about DIP 1008? Uh, I think uh, we, we marked it as postponed. And I know there, there was an implementation in the compiler, right? Okay, DIP 1008 is implemented and it works. The problem is, is the backtrace code that was added uh, to the runtime does not work with DIP 1008 and I don't really know why it doesn't work with DIP 1008, and I don't know how the backtrace code works. So I was hoping somebody who understood how the backtrace code worked could uh, look into fixing it. But that's that's where the choke point is on it. If you don't care about backtraces, DIP 1008 works. All right, isn't it about the GC allocations? Yeah, backtrace is doing something with mm-hmm. the GC. And uh, I don't know what, you know, being a backtrace, you don't really care about recycling the memory because you're leaving the program. <laughs> so there's no reason for the backtrace to require the GC at all. It can just allocate memory and then forget about it. It's not a big deal. I recall uh, Razvan bringing this up before. He had a couple of potential solutions for it. But yeah, so just use malloc, right? Yeah, that's the backtrace can just use malloc and it doesn't even have to because it's exiting the program. <laughs> mm. You don't need to wow. manage memory when you're leaving the program. Unless, of course, you store the back there somewhere and carry on with the program because you caught it. Oh, then you kind of deserve what you get, I think. <laughs> the backtrace is, is for a fatal exception. And you shouldn't be catching those and trying to you know, restart your program or continue running. But I mean, oh, well, it could be a server. And it, it could be just logging uh, the backtrace and then carry on. Yeah, because I mean, exceptions aren't necessarily supposed to be fatal. The errors are, but not exceptions. No, there, there are two kinds of exceptions. There's errors and exceptions. <laughs> there's errors, which are fatal. Yeah. Okay, and there's uh, the the throwables, well, well the, uh, the exception class, which is uh, 
catchable and and recoverable. But do we need backtrace for the recoverable? Time out, time out. Uh, Steve says, I have a PR incoming that will remove GC usage from trace info. Well, <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> thank you, Steve. <laughs> yeah, but even the error stuff, it gets um, more complicated because imagine you're writing the Excel add-in and you say, well, you know, errors, what can you do? Problem is you don't want to crash Excel for the user. And if you don't catch the error and try to continue, it's bubble. And because out of bounds is error, uh, errors as well. So we've had problems with that in the past. You, you can't recover from a fatal error in D. It's not designed to, and in fact, you can't, because if you have a bounds error and stuff, it's, it's not recoverable. Your program has failed. And uh, how we, that can be uh, recovered in Excel, I don't know. But whatever D code you wrote for Excel, if it's throwing fatal errors, it's it's bad code. You know how to fix it. Sure, but uh, the add-in should fail and not work anymore. But don't take Excel down with you, which is what well, happen. I don't know how Excel macros and D work, but if you're running them in the same application or the same process space, you're going to have that problem whenever you have a bug in the D code. It's going to bring down Excel with it. There's there's no escape on it. The only escape on that is you actually run the code in a sandbox or in a separate process. And then when the process fails, you just take down the process, not Excel, and restart the process. Right. But it's a shared library that gets loaded in. So basically what we do is we, we have to catch errors and print a message out and then Hope for the best. You can still do that even if you're allocating memory and not freeing it. Sure. Okay. So you, you still don't really need to recover the memory on this because you're, you're not going to be failing and producing gigabytes of, of stack traces. It's just, you know, something horrible has happened and you don't really need to uh, account for that situation. Okay. I want to address Stephen's point about removing exception handling. We're not removing exception handling. The The question was, if there was a feature I could remove, <laughs> what, I didn't, what would I pick? And that would probably be exception handling. But, you know, I, I absolutely know that there's far too much code that's totally dependent on it, and it, there's just no way we can remove it. I mean, it's similar. I, I forgot to say it, but I should have replied with classes. Uh, yeah, so we're not going to remove it. I was good. I was about to say that you mentioned it last year in your talk. At, uh, yeah, classes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I wrote a library showing that they're not necessary in the language. You don't need. Them. Yeah, but you know, twenty years ago, I didn't know that. <laughs> sure, sure, of course, and we're not going to take them away now. But it's, it's yeah, Robert's going to fight you. In, in language with, with compile time reflection, you just don't need it. Oh, Adam's going to fight you too. Class is so good, but I, I wanted to get this uh, comment from Adam in earlier that I. I didn't have a chance to get in yet. Uh, he's saying D exceptions used to be more efficient than they used to. Uh, D exceptions used to be more efficient than they are now, but it got changed for more compatibility with C plus plus. Yeah, I guess. Oh, oh, I I know what he's talking about. Um, I originally wrote it with my own exception handling scheme, hmm. which was, which did meet the C plus plus spec for it, but. The way ELF exceptions work is very complicated. And in order to be compatible with ELF exceptions, I had to you know, rewrite the whole thing. And yeah, it's slower and much more complicated. The ELF exception unwinding mechanism is uh, ridiculously complicated. The original D's exception unwinding mechanism is uh, very simple. Well, for one thing, we only have to support uh, certain kinds of objects, not any value type. You know, That makes a difference too. Google Summer of Code 2023 was recently announced. Any particular projects you'd like to see proposed? In particular, do you think some project proposals on iOS and Android support may be of high value? I, I agree. That'd be great. Oh. Web assembly and, you know, not only those, how many other things I'd like to see through the. Every time I propose something, uh, people go do something else. So mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of reluctant to propose anything. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I can say, uh, you know, last year uh, we didn't apply because I missed the deadline. I completely forgot about it. And uh, this year we are all in 
uh, Razvan and Dennis and I had a meeting Friday afternoon for them, and uh, we talked about our plans for applying to the Google Summer of Code this this year. So we're going to start making some announcements about that. I personally don't have any particular specific projects that I'd uh, like to see, and I guess Walter's reluctant. Oh, I do. Well, go ahead. Say it. Say it. Don't be shy. Uh, Robert <laughs> Robert brought this up. We have uh, Visual D in Visual Studio, but apparently the uh, the plugins for other languages are far more advanced than Visual D is. So improving Visual D would have a, a large leverage effect on getting people to use D and making it attractive for them to use D because the modern way of coding is to use an IDE and D's support in IDEs currently is not as good as other languages. So that would be a very, uh, very helpful thing to do is in making any progress on uh, making the uh, visual C plugin for D work better. I think there's a language server that he was talking about. Yeah. So any progress on that would be good. Ricky says, uh, right now I'm pretty certain DCD server can be rewritten to use DMD front end. Visual D has already got it in use in this context. Awesome. Yeah, the, basically you the, I just replaced the main program <laughs> with it. Yeah, even you can these works, but uh, it has the UFCS limitation. And so it really doesn't know where the function came from. And uh, that is quite annoying. And DMD obviously doesn't have that problem. Yeah, actually, now that you mentioned that, uh, Robert also talked about uh, he, he, he would like to see DMD as a daemon service uh, running in the background. So it would be the language server uh, and it would uh, yes. monitor the uh, file system for changes and compile in the background. That would be pretty friggin' awesome. The more I think about it, the more that would be good. So I guess I do have a project I would like to see. However, I'm not sure if Google Summer of Code is using the uh, shortened schedule this year that they had last year. They reduced the uh, length of the event last year, so I, I haven't looked into that yet. That would affect what kind of projects we propose, I think. Steve asks, what is your favorite beer for BeerConf? Rainier beer, of course. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, because I was just in Brazil for a month, and where I was in Brazil, didn't have a good selection of beers, so I was drinking Heineken the whole time. And as soon as I got here to Seattle, I ordered a pale ale. And as soon as I tasted it, it was like, oh my God, real beer, I missed you. <laughs> I don't uh, know what it was. Spoofer asks, has anything changed in the at safe by default consideration? No. Not yet. We do have a dip in the queue, a draft dip in the, in the PR queue. I, I contacted the author a while back, uh, asking if they were ready for moving forward, and I didn't hear anything back yet. So I'll ping them again uh, soon. Well, especially since Walter's, you know, break with tradition of we can't do dips because I know what I think we should do anyway. So I've, I've made some comments on that dip, mm -hmm. and it's probably easier if I just write one because that's what I think you do. Yeah, I think I think we get. That rule has been prohibitive for us. I don't think it's helped us. And I think it's time we, we got rid of it. You know, you guys should be able to write your own dips. Um, we have a question from N. What would be the key reasons to learn D if we already spend time to learn Rust? I'm open to the idea, but not sure if I should take that path. Uh, the number one reason is simplicity. It's just easier and simpler to write code in D because you don't have to care about lifetimes because of the DC. Yeah, I've heard that from other people too. Uh, with Rust, you spend so much time trying to deal with your memory allocation issues that it, it's hard to prototype a solution to a problem with it. Because when you prototype, you want to keep trying different things and different data structures and different organizations. And Rust makes that very, very difficult to do. Whereas D, you can... Uh, it, it's much easier to prototype a solution without having to worry about the borrow checker or anything like that. So I think it's probably writing Rust may be best if you're translating an existing working <laughs> program to Rust and trying to develop it in Rust to begin with. But I'm not a Rust developer, so maybe I'm wrong about that. Even then, you'd have to take care of the borrow checker by converting that code. So 
Um, but yeah, it's just going to be a lot easier to write decode. I don't think anybody would argue uh, Python v Rust was easier to write. And I don't think it's very different if you replace Python with the in this context. My discovery with C after years of using it is uh, C code is very brittle. All the C programs I had use the same algorithms they started out with. And the reason is because it's, it's hard to change the algorithms in C code. And one of the big reasons is memory allocation. Once you figure out your data structure and who owns it and where you free this stuff, uh, it becomes very, very difficult to change the code. D offers a lot of plasticity. One of the plasticity things is there's no distinction between dot and arrow in D. So if you want to switch something from a value type to a reference type or vice versa, you just change the type. You don't have to go change all the code along with it. And with C, you're looking at, oh my God, I've got to you know, do a search and replace on hundreds and hundreds of right arrows to switch them to a dot or vice versa. You know, although technically Rust code can be as fast as any other language, I think practically it's going to have a hard time because you, you're probably using a less efficient algorithm in Rust because it's so hard to rewrite it into a more efficient algorithm, whereas with D it's easy. Uh, Steve asks, is there any thought to making WASM an official platform, WebAssembly? The problem is always who's going to work on it. It's not like we're opposed. I mean, that would be great. But yeah, I'm all for I'll, I'm all for it. <laughs> Doesn't LDC support it out of the box right now? I would assume. So. Yeah, I believe I yeah. believe they do. Yeah, I think we're good then, aren't we? Yeah, but you know, it's not an official platform. Uh, but the thing about making it an official platform is resources. Where do they come from? So yeah, that's always the problem. And Steve notes that also official support means that PRs to the uh, library or compiler must build with. Uh, Wasm to be accepted. Uh, yeah, there's uh, Adam noted that we still need to upstream uh, D runtime support. There was a, there's a project out there that Sebastian Kappa started that he uh, hasn't had time to finish on a Wasm D runtime. And I know Adam, you you had something, didn't you? Uh, a mini runtime or something for Wasm. And uh, Bruce asks, does the front end architecture admit a relatively simple multi-target single source capability down the road. This would be useful for multi-target libraries. Um, the friend already uh, supports switch selectable targets. So you can generate Windows object files for, on the, uh, when you're running the compiler on Linux and vice versa. And I should have done that a long time ago. It really made things nicer because I don't always have to boot up another platform just to fix a bug in it. I can just generate the object file and go, oh, I know where the problem is and just fix it. So it's a big time saver as, as well as uh, making a cross compilation po possible. The problem is, is the linker. I can generate the object files, but I don't have any control over the linker. So how do I do a cross platform link? Like how do I run Microsoft linker when I'm, you know, running a, the compiler in a Linux box? That's not an easy problem to solve. I mean, you could run the uh, Microsoft ecosystem under an emulator, but that's probably just a major project getting that to work. Uh, and Bruce says multi-target with regards to CPU variant, not OS. To enable CPU ID based patching or dispatch at runtime. Oh, I see what you're talking about now. Uh, the way to do that is you write two modules, each with different CPU switches, and then you have a third module decide which function you're going to call. I mean, you've, you've always had the ability to do that. Trying to switch CPUs in the middle of compilation of a module is probably not a good idea anyway, but if you separate out your, your CPU specific code into two different modules, and then you decide when you're calling it, which module you're going to execute, you can make that switch at runtime. Okay. looks like I have a question in the email from Dennis for Walter and Attila. What are your thoughts on programming with AI, such as GitHub Copilot or ChatGPT? I've enjoyed using Copilot for D auto completion and wonder if maybe we shouldn't be too concerned about improving IDE support with Serve D if, quote, traditional autocomplete might become obsolete anyway. Wow, that's a great question. Uh, I haven't tried 
uh, Copilot yet. It's on my list of things to look at. So I haven't programmed with AI trying to write the code for me yet. And as far as ChatGPT goes, I'm still trying to figure out how to better use it. I'm not sure I trust the direct D code right now because the thing is, I'd have to read the whole thing anyway. So I'm not sure. Basically, I don't think I have enough experience with either of those two things to have an informed opinion right now. Well, I don't have experience with it either, but that won't stop me from pontificating about it. Um, I think uh, if Copilot works and it's a tool that is on GitHub, uh, why do we need to uh, sort of reinvent the wheel here? Well, there is the issue about uh, license violations. Apparently, oh, right. Microsoft's problem, not ours. No, if it goes into your project, if the if the code that is being auto completed goes into your source code base, then your project is violating uh, the license potential. If there's a violation, but, but that's Microsoft's problem because oh, they run Copilot. But the code is in your code base. Yeah. Well, I would have to then enable the user would have to enable Copilot for their code base in order to use Copilot. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. We're talking about we're talking about auto completion. Copilot generates. Okay, you're going to uh, put in a code snippet or an auto complete or whatever, but it, it wouldn't happen with auto complete, but it would happen with code snippets. But you're going to paste this code from Copilot automatically into your code base, and this code violates. This code has a license, and you don't realize this code has that license, and now that that's, that that's Copilot's responsibility. It has to be responsible for to give you snippets that you can use yeah yeah but no, but uh, it's, a useless, it's a completely useless tool and mike mike shaw just says uh, i think program synthesis research is working on this probably someday but i only mentioned this because this was just all over uh reddit recently a few weeks ago and steve says even with tools like this we still need language server because you're going to read the code more often than you're going to write it anyway which means you still want to jump to that definition, know all the, the call sites for this particular function, that kind of thing. So it doesn't matter how the code got written, you're still going to need to navigate it and read it. And you're going to do that more often than, than writing. And as uh, Steve says, I'm with Walter, then don't use Copilot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, it's what does Copilot use for its training data? If it's source so process repositories that shouldn't be using those but if they're public repositories on open source licenses just you know yeah but oh the other thing is oh, it's not a copyright violation to copy a snippet of code it has to be a substantive snippet mm -hmm. okay just like if i copy 10 words out of a, a a copyrighted book that's not copyrightable i there's some minimum number of words it has to be before it's a copyright violation. Well, so if you're just like, you know, what is the next keyword I use or what is the next expression I use, that's not really copyrightable anyway, especially if you make it public. Well, you shouldn't you shouldn't pry into people's private databases anyway, okay? But if it's a public database, it shouldn't matter what the license is if you're gonna use snippets from it, as long as they're under a certain size. That's my, uh, not, I am not a lawyer legal opinion. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, we have a, a comment here from Spoofer. It largely depends on how much people spend on lawyers. There is precedent for that. So, though, like I said, I'm not a lawyer. And if you want to, if you need legal advice, talk to a real lawyer. <laughs> well, I long ago decided that I didn't care if people copy my, copied my code. I figured that's the sincerest form of flattery. So go ahead and copy it. <laughs> that's why it's boost license. I don't care anymore. I used like to worry all about that stuff, you know, 20... 30 years ago, not anymore. Just there it is. I write it if you want to use it. Go ahead. I don't care. Uh, what's the next big thing for D in the next five years? That's the question from Spoofer. I think memory safety. We're already pretty close. Yeah. We just have to, uh, you know, take the last few steps and then we've got it. We've got, I think we've got a clear path to memory safety and uh, we just have to follow it. I mean, if I have to pick the, the big think for D for the next five years, it would be to have that compiler daemon. Because it would just fundamentally alter how we work and the feedback loops. Because it's just uh, life's too short for me to wait for the compiler and the linker. I think that you know the linker takes time too. 
And it'd be great if I didn't even have to link anything. Well, I have many times thought about having the compiler directly generate an executable without going through a link step. I don't even want to generate an executable, though. Oh, you just want it to run? <laughs> yep. Just run my tests and run the tests that, that need running. I just, just do it. Yeah, you have a point there. I think by the time that I'm producing a binary that someone else can execute, I'm bored now. Like, that's just the <laughs> That's That's just you know, a delivery mechanism after I've done the real work. Yeah, one of the things I liked when I was uh, using Eclipse to program Java is how it just yeah. compiled the file in the background, you know, it was constantly compiled. But it would be different for us. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get the final executable probably every time you compile the file, but you could get the object files anyway. Well, like uh, in the live stream, I think that's when I mentioned it. Uh, what I really want is to go from editing to my tests to run as fast as possible. And I don't really care how. The problem there is, of course, compiling, emitting the object files and, well, emitting the code and then linking takes time, but how much time will it take to interpret instead, for instance, or to generate some sort of bytecode instead? So it's the whole pipeline that needs to be measured. And for me, to make so that it goes from editing the code to running the tests in the, as fast as possible. Yeah, that's the REPL idea. Yeah, but it isn't clear to me if, you know, an interpreter is faster or bytecode or JIT. Well, CTFE, our CTFE shows that interpreting the ASTs is a slow way of doing it. <laughs> That's probably a design decision I wouldn't do if I was doing it over again. Uh, we've got another question from Steve. Uh, he says, is there a definitive plan for Phobos V2? I ask because I would love to just resume my goal of removing auto decoding from Phobos V1 if Phobos V2 isn't going to happen. It's going to happen. There's a plan. I'm just not working on it yet because I need to, I think there are things that need to be fixed first, but that's what I want to do. I, I think that the logical sequence of operations is continue the work I was doing in the previous switches, then finish allocators and put it out, take it out of experimental, and then Phobos V2. Because I don't think it makes sense for me to work on Phobos V2 when allocators aren't even part of Phobos V1 properly yet. And I need to talk to Andre because of some of the questions I raised during the decon uh, about allocators. And that, of course, by itself is already quite a significant chunk of work because we need to be sure about the API, especially if we're going to take it out of experimental because then, you know, it's going to be there forever. Well, for Phobos V2, we'll try to get it right the first time around. Uh, Ricky says, I'm pretty sure the entire design of standard.experimental.allocators is going to be a pretty big mistake. It takes a few too many assumptions, especially with I shared allocator versus I allocator. Uh, I would love to be able to discuss that at length. No quick comments now? I'm not sure about those interfaces myself. Um, so... I don't, I don't know specifically what he's talking about. I think I need to talk to Ricky to, to know it's possible he's right. I don't know. Uh, Ricky says, I've done my own allocator library based upon it, so I'm not just talking nonsense. <laughs> sure. But again, I need to talk to you to know what it is you think. <laughs> uh, we've got another question from Bruce. What are the barriers to using Mold? The oh, It's a linker. It's a faster linker, uh, in case you haven't heard of it as opposed to LLD? I'm using it now, so I'm not aware of any problems. I'm using it every day. That's what, that is the linker I'm using in my system. I don't know anything about it, so. <laughs> I mean, it's something that does, yeah, I hate waiting. It's faster. Of course I know about it. Of course I've been using it. So it's it's the linker in my system. I just sim linked uh, LD to, to LD.mold instead. Now, there were some problems before, but the author seems to have fixed them, particularly when I was working on the NDFO, was it was producing batteries that crashed. I don't think that's happening anymore, but I'm not sure if it's been a while. But for the rest of the work I've been doing, I've been using Mold daily for, I don't know, months. Uh, is there a Windows version of Mold? I don't know, and can't say I care too much. Yeah, I, was, yeah, I figured you wouldn't, but I'd ask anyway. I mean, if on Windows, it's already so slow that it barely matters what you're using. Uh, here's a question. Did anything about the community governance ideas go anywhere? We're going to have an announcement when we can about uh, something that we're doing right now that's related to that. We've got everything on pause. It's it's the governance proposal 
that we discussed in a meeting a while back, you know, was rejected pretty much, uh, not, not quite unanimously, but it was rejected. What we settled on was that ecosystem management team that I uh, have mentioned several times. And uh, that's still on the books, but I keep saying that's uh, for next year. And, you know, we're maybe going to delay it a little while longer because uh, we're doing something right now that's going to, I don't want to say too much about it until we announce it, but I, I think that we're going to be able to approach this in a way that's going to make it more effective and efficient than the original idea I had. That's our goal. Anyway, we're, we're basically learning some new skills to apply to management. More on that when I can announce. A question from Max. Any thoughts on how to fix the, quote, write a type that behaves like a built-in slice, end quote, challenge proposed by Andre and then more recently by Amory? Well, I don't really know specifically where uh, slices fall short, so I can't really answer that. But yes, I think we should be able to write a custom type that behaves like a built-in slice. Steve says, try it. It's hard. I think I will. So try it and come up with a specific list of the shortcomings. Spoofer says, uh, after the some types pattern matching, reviewing how const interacts with things and addressing with a head mutable or whatever solution would be a great next thing. I know uh, Dead Linux also complains about that, but you know I, I can't get anything specific out of it. <laughs> He just says it doesn't work. And uh, I guess I need specifics. Okay, write a piece of code that doesn't work. It's as simple as that. Yeah, that sounds too abstract to me right now as well. Alexander asks, how about organizing a fund to order an official IDE for D from JetBrains? Don't think it's going to work that way. No, I don't think so. I don't think we get enough donations to begin with. And who knows how much they charge? Yeah, we 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 don't have million dollar budgets. <laughs> yeah, we 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 had a hard time raising three thousand dollars for a pull request manager's quarterly payment before uh, Symmetry started sponsoring us for it. There is a deep plugin for IntelliJ. You know, I was talking about earlier. I don't remember what the name is, but it's there. And he makes the the guy who's uh, leading the project his handle on the forums is Singing Bush, I think, and he makes uh, periodic announcements in the forums, uh, and he's always looking for more help. So if anybody is using IntelliJ, please consider uh, giving some help to that project in, in any way that you can. I'd also like to point out that you, you can't just buy an IDE from JetBrains. I mean, it's gonna have to be maintained. So it's not just the expense to build it, it's gonna be a considerable long-term expense trying to contract it to be maintained. And that's uh, kind of, you know, frankly, it's beyond our means at the moment to do that. What we'd love to do is convince JetBrains to do it on their own. <laughs> Anybody got any uh, inside pull at JetBrains? That's how we got into the Amazon and Facebook uh, conferences. We, we got our conferences at Amazon and Facebook was inside pool. Yep. I, I've done a couple of these uh, interviews with uh, Walter on our YouTube channel. Uh, where we sit and uh, chat, uh, chatted about D. And I think the next time I have this chat with Walter, we're going to talk about the future instead uh -oh. of the past. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll have a long list of questions for you then, I'm sure. And I'm, yeah. And I'm going to try to to expand those. So I'm curious uh, from Walter and Attila and anybody in the community, uh, what kind of content would you like to see on our YouTube channel going forward? I have plans for a tutorial to talk about things as basic fundamental stuff is, you know, object files and linking and all that the stuff that we don't normally cover in detail. So I got some plans for that. What other kinds of content would you like to see on our YouTube channel? Well, one thing that seems to be popular that other people do is they turn on a screen recorder and record themselves developing a project. So I think that could be pretty cool, especially if you're writing a smaller project to just turn on the screen recorder and start writing it and debugging it and sort of talking about what you're doing while you're doing it. Those kind of videos seem to be immensely popular and they seem like easy to make, just require somebody to, uh, to do it. DMD development with Walter Bright. Yeah, I should do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually thought of doing that, but... And I tried it once. It didn't work out too well, but, uh, Brian, you know, it, Brian Callahan says you're stealing my talk and workshop tomorrow. Walter, he has the, 
He has 15 uh, videos uh, as part of that uh, workshop, uh, 15 clips. Well, and uh, that's, I'm going to be uploading them, publishing them all tomorrow. So you'll, you'll be able to watch it. Uh, well, it's not live. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad to see this happening. And, you know, ideas for more, you know, I, I don't think we can have enough of those. Mm. So there, there is no like, oh, it's been done. Any project you're working on, if you want to, you know, record yourself working on it, I think would make a good video. Yeah, I'm trying to think of ways we can use YouTube shorts to just spread the word, you know, interesting things we could put on there. I'll, I'll have to focus on that for a while. Anything from you, Attila, that you'd like to see? Any content? Um, tutorials mostly, I think, so that there's material for people to learn D, but mostly just people using D to build something cool, I think, especially for playing to its strengths. Because I think it's also hard to explain what really does work about D, so that might be a good way to do it. Because the features themselves, I think a lot of people don't see what's special about it, but it's the way they come together. And so for that, probably seeing people develop real code, doing something cool, obviously, because otherwise if the project isn't cool, nobody's gonna care. Uh, Mike Shaw says, I think seeing recordings of folks building D tutorials is incredibly useful. And he knows what he's talking about because he's doing that himself on his own YouTube channel. And uh, I've been pointing people in that direction lately. So, yeah. <laughs> Also, you know, videos don't have to be very long. I mean, how how long are the shorts? The shorts, a uh, few seconds, I think. Yeah, these are just blurbs. YouTube shorts are just, you know, click. Okay, there we click go. It and view it, yeah. And not, you know, not a major investment in time. Hmm. And even even I think normal YouTube videos shouldn't be that that long. You know, it's like uh, I think what Brian did with his workshop is just right. You know, the it's fifteen videos, and it sounds like a lot, but it's you know each video is only between nine to 20 minutes long you know 20 minutes is the high end there's only a couple of them that long and you know most of them are around 10 to 15. dennis is doing a series of tutorials for us for our youtube channel on uh, uh contributing to dmd and his videos are short that's his target my target for the uh, tutorials i'm going to be doing are, is short so yeah i think that's the way you do it these days i i think the time for 40 50 minute tutorials is is long I tell you what, I had a hard time coming around to uh, video tutorials. I was a blog post kind of guy, you know, when I was learning to program and I just didn't get how people could sit in front of a video and watch people code. But I have completely come around on that. I'm totally sold. But if I see a video that's like an hour long or an hour and a half long, I just skip right by it. So I, I think it's, you know, short, shorter uh, running time is much better here. I reach for the double speed button on the YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Steve made the point that uh, uh, a lot of young people use video tutorials for things they are unfamiliar with. I agree. Yeah, I, I think that's read anymore. Yeah, it's not, you know, and that's that's where we need to be uh, directing our attention to bring people in. I, in I think because they're going to be with us a long time. We have a question here from uh, Dennis for Walter. How do you find a function definition in your editor, Micro Emacs? since it doesn't have a smart go-to definition. Some languages have a uh, FN or DEF keyword to grep, but D doesn't. Okay, how I find it is I open another window and I type uh, ME, which is my editor, space, backtick, grep, dash L, function name, star dot D, backtick. In other words, prehistoric stuff. Prehistoric, yep. <laughs> and what it does is it passes a list of files that have hits on that to my editor, and then I, you know, just search using the editor. And my editor will, you know, highlight all the searches it finds, which is convenient. I do this, meta dot, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I keep thinking I need to add that capability to my editor, but, you know, yeah. It's better that I work on D than working on my editor. Uh, Dennis has a follow-up. He says, doesn't that find call sites? Yes, finds both. Any closing thoughts? Anything you want to say before we leave, guys? Uh, well, I'm really enjoying this and uh, glad to be able to talk, to talk to everyone out there. And keep programming in D. It's the best language ever. I'm going to repeat what I did at the, the end of mine. D rocks. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, or as Robert says, D is the best language. Um,